for our scripture this morning. It's found in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28. So I don't need to wear this. So Matthew 20, starting in verse 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Is that right? Okay, sorry. Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or your servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Turn the time now over to Steve. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Nice to be worshiping together this morning. Got my mask here. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I, I forget to put this thing on and I forget to take it off. When I'm at the beginning of the day, I run into stores and, and work and get halfway into the, the building and realize, oh, I don't have my mask on. And then I get home at night and realize I still have it on. <laughs> oh, my. Well, a few years ago, uh, our family uh, did a obstacle course uh, race called a Tough Mudder. I don't know how many of you have heard of a Tough Mudder, but um, it's uh, one of those uh, races where you get really muddy. And uh, during the course of uh, our race, we, um, we were doing a, a monkey bar. You kids have done monkey bars before. We had about 25 feet of monkey bars to do, and below us was this muddy, slimy pit of water. And uh, I got halfway across these monkey bars, and somehow or another, my feet got tied together. And you wouldn't think that you would need your feet to do monkey bars, but you really do use them. And uh, my feet, uh, the laces had somehow clasped onto the, the latches on my other foot. And there I was hanging between heaven and earth uh, on this muddy, slimy pit below me. And I was being nudged from behind from some guy who was wanting to get past me. And I ended up plunging to my uh, abyss below. Anyway, uh, the reason I tell you that this morning is this is uh, <clears throat> my first attempt, not my first attempt, but a reattempt at using technology. And uh, sometimes I feel like using technology is kind of like trying to run a race when your feet are tied together. And uh, <clears throat> when they get tied together, it's like you fall flat on your face. So. We may fall flat on our face this morning, but we'll give it a try and see how things uh, go along here. Um, maybe we'll have one more prayer just uh, on that note. Loving Father, I don't want to waste anyone's time this morning. We've come for a blessing. We're asking that you would bless us. Father, you know the trouble I have with technology at times, and uh, we don't want to be tripped up by it this morning. We want your message to be heard and uh, realized and that we'd receive a blessing and leave this place better than when we came. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Many questions loom as we think about a new year. Many are fearful of hard times ahead. Restricted freedoms, unknown pandemics, if you go on to any news feed today, you'll find anxiety, fear, and despair being presented. I like to go and turn the off button because I need something better. I need prophecy. That's where I go. That's where I go to find assurance of the future that God, somebody, is in control. One epidemiologist has said, recently that this coming year will be kind of a mystery. Well, that's real helpful, isn't it? Or the likes of Nostradamus, who's predicting asteroids, earthquakes, and plagues. 
Well, more anxiety, fear, and despair. Hmm. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we look to the Bible to find answers. We look to Bible prophecy to allow us to see what is coming in the future. And yet that future can seem so vague and distant at times, can't it? I want to t talk to you this morning about one prophecy that's worth looking at that will be like, that will be fulfilled today. It is one that affects every one of us and it requires the closest uh, immediate action. The story I want to look to at this morning is found in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 and 21. I guess I'm one slide behind here. There we go. Matthew 20, verses 20 and 21. Here is the story of James and John and their mother. They are the sons of Zebedee. They are among one of the first of Jesus' disciples, also called sons of thunder. John is also referred to, uh, as you read through the Gospels, as the beloved disciple, maybe the one that was most close to Jesus. But we have this story here in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 20 and 21. And it reads, Then the mother of Zebedee's son came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him, that is, Jesus. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. Hadn't Jesus promised a hundredfold in this life and a portion of the kingdom to come? To sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel? Didn't it seem like a reasonable request? to ask of Jesus to promise or maybe to prophesy and to secure and establish her sons as special places in God's kingdom? I mean, what mother wouldn't want something special like that for their sons? But while they desired a closeness with their Savior, something else very earth-shattering was going on. And we read about it in Mark chapter 9, 34, where the disciples are disputing who would be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It turned out that John and his brother James were already one up on the rest of them who asked Jesus if they could be on the right and left of Jesus on his throne in the kingdom. But as we go and look at the other gospel writers as they depict and tell this story, reminded of John and James, who as they were passing through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem, finding a group that opposed Jesus. And it was John who asked Jesus, shall we not call fire down from heaven to consume those who oppose us? Is that the kind of leader that you would choose to elect? Do you feel comfortable in the presence of someone who over you who wanted to dominate and control you in such a violent fashion, maybe to threaten you? Apparently, this was the spirit in the beloved John. Hmm. Interesting note, this story of John is not found in the Gospels of John. It's not found in the writings of John. And I'm wondering, I think I can reason why. I mean, as I think back on this past year, as I think on my past life, and I think about the terrible blunders I've made, the mistakes, the, uh, the roads I wish I hadn't traveled, and I think, I don't want to recount this again. And I imagine John, as he's telling his story, that he feels similarly about his past. But something obviously happened to John. And the question I want to ask with you this morning is, what happened? In John chapter 20, verse 25 and 26, we're skipping down just a couple of verses. 
disciples are disputing among themselves, and they're very displeased. They're angry with John and James for asking this special favor of Jesus. Jesus, recognizing what's going on, he's on his way to um, the last week in Jerusalem. He says to them, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Gentiles, lording over them, it shall not be so among you. As Jesus describes to his disciples his sufferings, his death, and then finally his resurrection, John and the rest of the disciples found themselves puzzled by the meaning of Christ's words. Had he not come to establish a kingdom, would they sacrifice everything and follow in Jesus' footsteps at the loss of all things? As we read the, the gospel account in the letters of John, we discover that something profound happened to him. As he writes his gospel account, he opens the book of John by listing the words of John the Baptist, which read, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, if you had lived a life like John, a son of thunder, one who wanted to control and dominate and to um, manipulate if, if needed to get his own way, if you had a dark, uh, embarrassing past that you wanted to cover up, wouldn't you be glad? Wouldn't you be excited to see someone who could take away the sin of the world? I imagine it was for John. And so he records for us those telling words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not only does he tell us about that Lamb, but later on he records, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Later on in John's letters, he reminds us that if we confess our sin as we behold that lamb, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He tells us to behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. He goes on and on. Let us not love in word or talk, he says, but in deed and in truth. John, at the end of his life, unable to come up with words to describe it, simply tells us God is love. There's no other words. He says, we have seen his life, his fullness. We have received grace upon grace. John knew by experience the forgiving love of God for him. And wouldn't you like it to be said about you that you also knew by experience the love of God for you? I sure would. Well, that John who wrote so eloquently of the love of God, who is give, was also given a special revelation of the great controversy. You know, I think it's important for us as uh, people, as parents, as uh, guardians of our children to reveal to our children a clear, unmistakable picture of the love of God before we introduce them to this almost uh, opposing great controversy this theme of war in heaven, as the book of Revelation describes, the picture of beast powers, oh, how frightening they can be. Well, John saw one of these beast powers rising up out of the sea in Revelation chapter 13, which the reformers, uh, Roger Williams, John Calvin, John Huss, and Martin Luther, just to name a few, identified this beast power as the Roman papacy who exercised 
a spirit of domination, control, and persecution for 1260 years, which the Bible had predicted in advance, also known as the Dark Ages, during which millions were killed for their faith. Imagine if such actions were taken today. Oh, there would be an uprising, wouldn't there? It's interesting that our beloved Pope Francis uh, this year has actually gone and, and made way uh, to the Waldensian community where many, many Waldensians lost their lives during that dark age period. What a contrasting picture we have of the, the work of this beast power and the great, great love of God. <clears throat> It was a religious system who required submission and actually attempted to change the truth about God. Well, what is the truth about God? The Bible says, thy way or thy truth is in the sanctuary. Salvation is actually displayed in the sanctuary in symbols. If we were to look at this particular picture, we would see at the beginning of the, uh, the sanctuary, the altar of sacrifice where our Lord gave his life for our sins, we see a wash basin of labor, which reminds us of the baptism of Jesus, where he displayed his death, burial, and resurrection. We see in the most holy place of that sanctuary a symbol of the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life that table of showbread where there were two stacks of six loaves of bread, maybe representing the 66 books of the Bible, across from which was the, uh, the lampstand where we have a seven-branched uh, candlestick where Jesus himself declared, I am the light of the world. Uh, we heard a song this morning, Go Light Your World. Um, we are lighting the world with um, Jesus. And then we have the altar of incense where the prayers of God's saints come up before our Savior. There is one mediator between God and man, and that man is Christ Jesus. And there Jesus is represented. And then in the most holy place of that sanctuary was the Ark of the Covenant, the law of God over covered with the mercy seat and the Shekinah glory, which was the visible presence of God himself. Well, this power came to subvert that message, that truth about God. And as we go through the sanctuary, once again, we see that the sacrifice of Christ was cast down and replaced by penance. As we move to the laver, we see that the baptism was cast down and replaced by infant sprinkling. As we move into the most holy place where we go to the table of showbread, we see that the word of God was cast down by the traditions of the church. As we go across the room to the uh, seven branch candlestick, we see Christ or to the uh, altar of incense, we see the mediation of Christ cast down and replaced by a confessional booth where we confess our sins to a man and then over to the candlesticks where the light of the church is cast down and replaced by the dark ages and ultimately into the most holy place where the law of God was cast down and where his law was changed. Don, John described this power in his day and described that it would exercise his power clear through the end of time uh, all the way down to our day today calling for a time when it would require worship and an identifying mark can you imagine surely not in the home of the brave and the land of the free but here, even in our own country, we've seen our religious liberty, liberties being eroded. The demonstration of control is in marked contrast to the love and liberty that God provides, the liberty that changed John's life 
Has it changed yours? One of the great reformers, Martin Luther, who lived during this oppressive, powerful rule, one of the great reformers who opposed this power and sought to reveal the truth of God, wrote about what he feared most. And it's not what you would expect. I mean, someone who had, had lived through that time, you would think, would warn us, beware, beware, beware. But what does he tell us to beware of? Martin Luther writes, I am more afraid of my own, my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals. I have within me the great Pope self. One writer put it this way, the papacy, papacy is simply a corporate manifestation of the universal human inclination to exalt self in the place of God, to justify self rather than resting in God's justifying grace, to control our fellow human beings by various coercive tactics rather than granting liberty of conscience. Now, while it's very interesting to watch the trends taking place in the religious and political world that we live in today, and how they may relate to Bible prophecies, such as the eroding freedoms, the alliances being formed, and the distortion of truth. The question that I find that is more closer to home that needs to be answered is, what is happening in my daily dealings with others? What is happening in my daily dealings at home, at church, and at work? Is my spirit the spirit of dominance and control, of coercion? Or do others see the blessing of the liberty of conscience being displayed in my life? This is the prophecy that will be fulfilled today in you and me. Are you prepared? Am I prepared to write the end of the story? You know, as leaders, are we, dis we have to ask ourselves, are we displaying a spirit of dominance, dictating and coercion? And as people, are we pointing fingers at others claiming their incompetence? Are we ready to call down fire from heaven as others who, at others who disagree and rally troops around us who do agree? Are we living life as though we are invincible, untemptable, waiting for some cataclysmic event to make sure things are right with us, before the, with God before the end. I think in my own life, it's time for me to look at things through God's lens. In the book Education, we read some very interesting uh, correlation between our own experience in this whole great controversy theme. I'm just gonna read through it that you can read it up on the screen. The student should learn to view the word as a whole, the word of God that is, to see the relation of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of its grand central theme, of God's original purpose for the world, of the rise of the great controversy and the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy and should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. He should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience, how in every act of life, he himself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic motives, and how whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he will be found. Do you know the Bible echoes about gossipers, busybodies, meddlers, those judging others, belittling others, being enticed by our own desires, 
but it never puts it in this context of the great controversy. But in every act of life, even now, we are deciding upon which side of the great controversy we will be found. What side do you want to be on? Well, of course, the winning side, right? I want to be on the winning side. This prophecy is to be fulfilled today. It will be fulfilled in our lives. We will decide which side we will stand on. We will be offended, great, great, guaranteed. Our liberties are going to be restricted. We may be insulted, ridiculed, our reputation shattered amidst conflicts and disputes. We will be tempted to go into the beast mode, which has nothing to do with the Seattle Seahawks, by the way. We will be tempted to point fingers, belittle others, dominating and manipulating in an effort to lift ourselves up. And isn't that what Satan himself would want us to do? Lord, help us to remember the words of Jesus to his disciples long ago. The rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, yet it shall not be so among you. May our picture of God, may my picture of God, be so grounded in the self-sacrificing love revealed in Christ at Calvary that it produces a voluntary faith that works by love in harmony with his law. Oh, that Christ might live his life in me. You know, every day is a new day. And we have the opportunity of beginning a new year. And I know we are prone to fail, we're prone to fall. And that's why it's so imperative that we understand the love that God has for each one of us. That if we do fall, if we do sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I wonder, this year, as you begin this year, that you will pray the prayer with me each morning. Lord, help me not to say a word. Help me not to do an act that will hurt anyone that would cause anyone to uh, miss out on knowing you. But may everything that I say, everything that I do, may it bring honor and glory to you. May that be our prayer this year as we seek to live out his life in us. Loving Father, as we leave this place today, may uh, we leave with the knowledge of your great love for us in contrast with the the uh, the kingdom of this world and the the ways of this world may we leave with the thought that uh, we might live for you and under the principles of heaven guide us we pray give us the courage the strength that we need and father if we should fail we are asking for your grace to lift us up and we just give our lives to you now bless us in jesus name Amen.